All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Elizabeth Clark at Airly Winery. It's July 16, 2019. Thanks so much for joining us today, Elizabeth. We My really pleasure. appreciate this. Um, let's start by asking uh, why wine? Uh, total fluke. I um, I didn't know anything about wine. I mean, my, my I grew up, my parents drank wine, but it wasn't a major thing. It was sort of a box in the fridge, and every once in a while on special occasions there was a bottle. But food and dinner had always been important, and I ended up in the area catering mm -hmm. and catered a lot for wineries and got interested um, not only in wine, but really in the people. Like, I enjoyed um, meeting the winemakers. I enjoyed the industry. I sort of, I liked this mixture of science and art and the fact that they knew what the weather had been like <laughs> for the last 10 years. I was like, how do you know? You know, but <laughs> now I know. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so uh, I met Myron through catering, actually, and um, and I really liked him. And I decided I was interested in wine, and I liked his wines, what little I knew about it. And I just went up to him one day and said, you know, I don't know anything. Will you give me a job? And he said, sure, <laughs> thankfully. So tell me about that process then, from just kind of being interested to actually learning wine. Uh, yeah, but, well, Myron, in his classic way, was like, well, I, I can only hire you part-time. So I started in February, um, and uh, February 14th of 2000. And, and then he figured out I could fix computers. My degree's in mathematics. And uh, he's like, oh, you can make our internet work? <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Full-time lasted, I mean, half-time lasted like a week. <laughs> After that, I was full-time. Um, but it obviously wasn't all wine. But he really, um, he was very inclusive and very good mentor. And as soon as he was doing anything, I was involved and I was tasting. And, and um, he really just threw me in headfirst, basically. And, and so I took classes at Shemekata before the, the program was so formal, but that associate's degree was already mm -hmm. available. And, mm -hmm. and so I just, a lot, mostly tasting classes that, um, to spend time with other people and just learn about wines and mm -hmm. taste and develop that vocabulary. Um, but a lot of it was Myron. Myron was really good about, uh, we were at an event. And I think his palate and his skill was so respected that oftentimes people would just bring him a wine to taste or say, what's your opinion? And I'm standing next to him and he just would promptly hand me the glass. So all of a sudden I met people and I tasted wines that maybe under a different mentor I wouldn't have had an opportunity to. And that really was, um, I think, what made him such an excellent teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he, um, yeah, so long concluded that's why wine and 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 it tied in with food so i still i still love to cook um dinner is important we have wine most nights with dinner um, we both cook both my husband and i do and it's it's part of that i think the social and the sitting down so for me wine's really about food like i very rarely will have a glass of wine if i'm not eating like mm -hmm. it's they go hand in hand for me so it drives my style of wine and everything because of that um, so let's yeah. back up a moment here. Yeah. Um, why Oregon? How did you end up here in the, in the first place? <laughs> uh, I like to say I hitchhiked a ride. It wasn't quite that informal, but I was at a wedding in California and there was a woman driving back to Oregon and her daughter was flying back and her daughter said, you know, mom would really like someone to drive back to her. And I'd never been to Oregon. And um, I had a cousin in Portland and I was like, well, it's as good an excuse as any reason. <laughs> I, so I went up to this woman I didn't know and was like, I hear you need someone to drive back to Oregon with <laughs> from Southern California. And she's like, yeah, sure. So that was um, Jewel Gray that owned um, Sir Hinkleman's Catering in McMinnville. And on the way up, she offered me a job in a car and a place to live for the summer. And I was like, sure, <laughs> I don't have anything else to do. <laughs> so I graduated by then. So I was definitely um, footloose sort of at that point. And I had been exceedingly fortunate and then I'd had a full ride scholarship. So I wasn't looking at student debt. So working or not working wasn't that big of, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't have to earn a job right now. I didn't have to make money. So I had a lot of flexibility right after college and, and it um, really opened up the world mm -hmm. because of that for me. So yeah, so Jewel, a place to sleep turned out to be on her office floor and um, <laughs> a car was a minivan and, <laughs> and I catered. <laughs> And if it wasn't the minivan, it was the RV that you would always had your fingers crossed was going to make it back from the catering event. <laughs> so, but it was excellent. And, uh, and they said, uh, if it weren't for Jewel, I wouldn't be here. So, you know, I mean, really, that's, that's the reason I'm in Oregon. It's the longest I've lived anywhere. As a kid, I'd always moved. We'd moved sort of every five years. So it was actually sort of strange when I hit five years here. I was like, isn't it time to move? I've been here for five years, you know. So, um, yeah. 
So that's how I ended up in, in Oregon. What was your first impression of Oregon? Um, it was really green. <laughs> <laughs> we came up in the summer, actually, so the wedding had been... Um, it had been a summer wedding, and, and it was sort of brown, and then as we got further into the valley. Um, and I still remember, I was driving over the Willamette, and you know how you make that leap when you get on the Marion Street Bridge from the south all the way on the left-hand yeah. and you have to... And, <laughs> and Jewel was trying, in the dark, is explaining, you have to get over there. And that's the Willamette, by the way. It rhymes with damn it. Of course, I have no <laughs> idea what she's talking about. I'm like, okay. You know? <laughs> she says, leap across four lanes of traffic. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, yeah, that was my impression. I still think about that sometimes when I'm leaping across all four lanes and, like, hoping everyone's paying attention. But it doesn't seem quite so chaotic as it did that very first time. Sure. So, yeah, so uh, um, I liked it, you know, and people talked about that. That year it didn't stop raining till July 4th. I remember that sort of being a... But I had just l spent the year before in England um, as a student at Exeter University. Mm -hmm. That had been my senior year. So I sort of was used to the idea that it was short short days in the winter and that it would be wet. But it doesn't turn... Just like here, southern England doesn't get white. It's not cold. It's just gray and mm -hmm. dark, right? Mm -hmm. So you could still be outside as long as you don't mind putting on a rain jacket you know, or whatever. <laughs> so... Um, so I sort of was semi-prepared, I guess, in that sense. And I think what I didn't know was just how beautiful the summers would be. Mm -hmm. And it is still what I love. I just love this time of year where it's light when I wake up in the morning and it's light when I go to bed at night. Like, sure. I just... Of course, I sleep all winter. My husband's like, aren't you getting up? I'm like, it's dark out. I can't get up. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the trade-off is. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Yeah. They're it's really short, short February. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's when my parents used like, come visit. <laughs> my parents retired to Hawaii. So ah, that's always an excuse to go. Like, excuse. Okay. Shortest days of the year. We're headed to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, yeah. so you meet Myron and you kind of ask for a job and mm -hmm. you're suddenly kind of thrown into the Oregon mm -hmm. wine industry. So tell me about what you thought about the Oregon wine industry, your initial impressions of, of, the, of the, the culture and the wine and the people. Um, I think inclusive in the sense that um, everybody had come from different things. Like I was a little bit odd in that I was so young. So for most most people who had come sort of fallen into the industry, like I would say I did, they weren't as, they hadn't done it as young. They had tried doing something else and then had fallen into the wine industry. Whereas just, like I said, through this sort of non-pressure situation that I was in, I was out kind of exploring options. And in fact, I had an uncle back east that was um, leaving, laying fiber net, you know, fiber internet. Um, in his county, and he was like, if you need a job, you can come. So I even had this in the back of my mind, that if Oregon totally wasn't interesting, I could just go work for Uncle Pat, and <laughs> it'd still be good, you know? <laughs> like, it'd all be fine. So, um, so yeah, and um, just a nice cross-section of people, like a nice mixture of people, and, and, and really their passion. I mean, nobody does this job, especially then, I think, if you didn't love it. Like, mm -hmm. that was why you did this, because something about it had sparked. You know, and if you ask Myron, it was his backpacking across Europe, and he had this great bottle of wine in a cafe, and was like, I want to know how to make this, you know what I mean? And, and for me, it was a little different in that sense. Like, I didn't have a wine epiphany. I really had the people epiphany mm -hmm. and this society and this community and said, this is cool, you know. So, and I always had the art and science. So my degree is mathematics and Russian, and I like origami and cross stitch, right? I mean, so I like something that's very precise, but at the same time gives you this piece of art mm -hmm. at the end, you know. And, um, and so I think that drew me in as well, that there clearly was. It wasn't all about the numbers. It was also about what it tasted like and how you felt about it and mm -hmm. what nature had given you. And, and uh, I think that was, yeah, part of what, that uh, was a big part of what drew me in. And, mm -hmm. and what I felt about the industry, what I liked about the industry, I mean, part of going back east, because my parents were on Long Island at the time in New York, was that it was to go back to that culture of people that I didn't really like. <laughs> I was like, hey, if I go home, like, I didn't feel like it was a failure, but it was just like, these aren't people I actually want to be around and live with and things like that. And, and I knew as much as I loved New York City on the short term that living there would probably kill me. I mean, just the high energy of it was just probably not good for my, <laughs> my genes, <laughs> my stress levels. I don't deal with stress real well. So <laughs> yeah, it was probably that, that kind of environment wasn't a great fit for me personally. So, so you sort of found the opposite. Of yeah, I did. <laughs> not by, not intentionally, but certainly, but Hawaii was like too casual. Cause I had lived in Hawaii for the year after college and 
that was like they didn't know how to work hard i mean they're like they pride themselves on not working hard like, i can't do that either like i do like to work hard i just want my downtime and you know as well so this has been a real good fit for me so tell me about the sort of education process of learning. You talk about the art and science, mm -hmm. learning through Myron, learning through Chemeketa, kind of the grasping the, the concepts of being a winemaker and, and what, what kind of drew you in about it? I think um, it really was just hands-on. I mean, I still laugh at myself that first harvest when, I mean, I didn't even know that red grapes and white grapes weren't fermented the same, right? I mean, I just had no clue at all about how anything was made. Like I just. I didn't even, I knew there was some yeast involved, <laughs> I mean, because I made bread. So it was like, I understand that yeast will do this, right? And I, um, and I think in hindsight, when I look back and, and even think about growing up and stuff, like, for example, my palate had always been, I mean, I used to drive my mother crazy that there was like three brands of orange juice I didn't like because I just didn't like something about them and mm -hmm. I couldn't necessarily describe it. And I was sort of particular that way about a lot of foods and chocolate and things like that. So I think there was maybe indications that I had some of the skill or some of the palate, you know, mm -hmm. um, to be able to distinguish it. But really, it was really doing. And Myron just saying, okay, now go do this. And I'm like, why am I doing that? And you're going to be like, okay, this is why you're doing it. You know, and then sometimes I was like, just go do it. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> you know? um, and the, um, Ron Shea had been the cellar master at the time when I joined um, uh, Amity and uh, and Ron was had a science background and a chemistry background he was very good about sort of explaining more of the chemistry behind it and certainly over the years my chemistry's gotten stronger mm -hmm. just out of self-defense <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, uh, and I still you know I'm a member of ASCV and I still like to read the journal and go to the annual meetings and things and so to continually educate I think is important um, that is part of what I still enjoy about the process and working with Oregon State and things, you know, that uh, it is changing and they are learning things. And I don't necessarily always agree with all the research ideas, you know, there's these sort of, well, we could go down that path <laughs> another time, <laughs> but I have a hard idea, time with, uh, maybe because we're small, so I don't have to build the same wine every year, and Mary doesn't expect me to build the same wine every year, that this idea that you're going to analyze the fruit to death so you know exactly what kind of wine you're going to have in the bottle when you're done, like, that doesn't interest me. Like, that's not, I think, part of the fun is saying, oh, geez, I have this fruit. What are we going to do with it? You know, mm -hmm. how are we going to make this fruit the best that I can make this wine, this vintage, with these conditions that I've been given? And that's actually what's enjoyable. I'm not interested in really making the same wine every year mm -hmm. that's not so the research a lot of research drive is driven by well what what do i need to measure in the grapes so that i have i know what i'm going to get in the wine and i'm like the part of the fun is and the frustration <laughs> is not knowing mm -hmm. what you're necessarily going to get mm -hmm. on the wine side so yeah so what point in the process did you decide or or how did you decide uh to be a winemaker of all, of all the, the possible jobs in the industry what was it about winemaking I hate sales. <laughs> I still hate sales. I do it under duress. I do do it, but <laughs> I do it under duress. Um, I don't know that it was a conscious decision. It was just sort of it happened and I, I enjoyed it. Um, and, uh, and Myron, over time, just gave me more and more responsibility. And, and we hired um, a second woman, Darcy Pendergrass. Um, of tartan sellers and so she came on the year after me and and Darcy I think her strength is um, her willingness to experiment and her willingness to sort of try different things and learn about things and do things and so I'm on a, lo a lot of ways I'm the steadier side so between the two of us Myron let a lot let us start to sort of talk about things and push things and change things and so and of course I think sometimes he felt like he was getting beaten up by the two of us right because we we have this great idea of iron and he's just like oh no you know? <laughs> what great idea do they have now we still tease him about there was a vintage where she and I took all the wines home to my place and we sat and made the reserves for that year the four because we had four single vineyards to make and we built them and 
we swear he spent we swear he spent the next three weeks trying to like come up with a better blend than what we had come up with and he kept preferring our blend he finally threw up his hands he's like fine we'll make the ones you guys made you know but there was a bit of like damn <laughs> so they're still nice wines yeah so that was um yeah so that kind of it just sort of happened i think it like I said, wasn't conscious and and i didn't um there wasn't another aspect that I enjoyed more. Mm -hmm. I mean, even for me, the tasting room is, the tasting room can be very fun, dependent upon the customer, mm -hmm. but being an introvert, it's also exhausting. Whereas Mary's like a true extrovert. And when Mar I come in on Monday morning, like she is fired up from working in the tasting room all weekend. Whereas if I have to work, it's like, don't talk to me. Like, <laughs> leave me alone for the next three days. <laughs> I'm used to all my conversation. <laughs> you know, so she and I are very different in that sense. So it works out real well. She gets to be the face and, mm -hmm. and drive, you know, make, make us look like we're social. And I get to make my wines and sit in the corner. <laughs> so, um, and probably now um, education appeals to me. Mm -hmm. So my father had been a university professor and and even that aspect, and that had been always my other career thought was what I teach. And there's aspects of that that still appeal to me. It's like now I feel like I have this base of knowledge and experience and at some point do I go share that with other people and mm -hmm. get them as excited about wine as, mm -hmm. as I am and what I do, so yeah. So speaking of, of Mary and this yeah. place, how did you find you come to find yourself here? Myron kicked me out the door. <laughs> <laughs> no, the position um, opened up here, unfortunately. Um, Susie Gagne had been the previous winemaker and she passed away unexpectedly. So Susie died in, in um, January of 05, I think. Mary will confirm that, but I want to say January 2005. And, uh, and of course, left all this wine half done, right? The whites weren't bottled or anything. And, and as an industry, we really came in. In fact, Darcy and I both came down a couple times and just helped Mary sort of get through. Because mm -hmm. um, Mary's not a winemaker and she's not interested in being a winemaker. So it was just one of the great things about working for her. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so I had kind of met Mary like that. And then she, she had lined someone up um, that was supposed to be the and something happened and it fell through and she called Myron and said, you know, I'm looking for, I need a winemaker. And, and apparently Myron asked her how much she's paying and was like, you're paying what? <laughs> <laughs> we were not well paid at Ebony. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Myron came to me and said, you know, why haven't you applied for this job? And, and it just so happened he and Darcy were both gone all summer. And I was like, like, you're both leaving. Like, I'm not going to leave the Amity wines sitting with no winemaker. And he said, just apply for the job and if you get it, we'll figure it out. So I drove down and, um, yeah, met Mary, you know, really sat and talked with Mary. And, and I guess the second interview, she offered me the job. And I still remember driving home going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what have I done? What have I, done? I can't do this, you know? So, um, so that summer I actually worked two days at Amity and two days at Early, and then the fifth day went to whoever needed it more. Yeah. So I spent the whole summer covering both wineries and um, and it worked out fine and uh, worked out great actually and Darcy got back and so 2005 was my first harvest here and uh, it um, I still I had a list like this of people I called in the middle of harvest and said am I doing this right? <laughs> what do I do now? You know I mean it was just it's like I'm not really sure because I was so used to it with Darcy and Myron and myself like you could always check with someone. You're like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm getting tired. Did I do my math right? You know what I mean? It was just, or this is what I'm thinking about doing. Do you think, you know, like, I was just so used to that support of the three of us, mm -hmm. you know, bouncing ideas that all of a sudden be like, okay, there's nobody to talk to about what we're doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, Mary could give me, well, this is what Susie used to do. And I could go through Susie's notes. And, and in some ways it was tougher that Susie had died because I couldn't ask her things. I could be like, why did you do this like this? Like I would have done it like, you know, so th there wasn't any of that give and take like you'd normally have from, from someone. So yeah, that was, thankfully it was an easy harvest. The fruit all got ripe all on its own. <laughs> the wines all made themselves. <laughs> it was good. So uh, yeah, so that was the beginning of, of early and, and uh, yeah. At what point did you, did you feel sort of confident without that security blanket? Um, probably took 
That first year was the worst. And a lot of what I did, which Darcy and I had started at Amity, and probably Myron had even started before um, um, Darcy and I started it, but I created more and more cheat sheets. So I really had, okay, during harvest, when I'm tired and I need to make an addition, just give me a place to plug the number in and give me the right answer. And I know I'm confident that it's the right answer when it comes out on the, you know, sort of the other side. So. Um, so that helped a lot, and then um, I just, I guess having been through it once and learning the equipment and sort of getting an idea of what kind of trouble I could have or not have, mm -hmm. you know, really that first year sort of assuaged me by the second year. Now, 06 was a little tougher vintage in the fruit, and I made some mistakes, I felt like, in 06, so it was a really hot year, um, fruit came in overripe. I chickened, back, chickened out on watering back, so I was adding water to fermenters, but I had never had to do that as I just, at Amity, we just did so it happened to basically always had pretty cool to moderate vintages, and I'd mm -hmm. never had a hot year, you know, and I still remember calling Darcy and saying, the water's sitting on top, and she's like, it'll do that, just keep pumping it in, because she had worked a couple of New Zealand harvests and had a better feel, whereas like my Tasmanian harvest had not, had also not been that hot, we hadn't had to add that much water, right, so it was like, so it's very weird you're looking at this fermenter that's like, you know, four feet of fruit and there's like eight inches of water sitting on top. You're like, this is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I sort of chickened out. And of course, in the end, the wines that really had gotten as much water as they should have gotten were better mm -hmm. than the wines that hadn't, you know. So it was like, okay, you know, like it really is okay to put it in and it really is, mm -hmm. does make better wine to do it, you know. So that sort of confidence came about. And then the next year it rained. And rain. So 07 was wet and we had a ton of fruit and it was so wet and it was so watery. And here I am pouring sugar in where I'm going, you know, <laughs> couldn't we just have two the same next to each other? You know, no, can't do that. So, uh, so I sort of had three real distinct vintages and then things, I guess, started even, evening out. Mm -hmm. 07 had it, ended up having its own trials and tribulations that were different than 06. But, um, so I think maybe after that, I kind of was like, okay, like I've dealt with three distinct vintages, mm -hmm. the one that made itself, the one that was too hot and the one that was too wet and there was way too much fruit. You're like, okay, now how do we, you know, I have, a, I have a theory on how I might deal with each one. But one of the things Mary always likes to point out to her customers um, is that, and I started young, like I only get like 30 chances to do this, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> There's not like <laughs> you get a lot. Of, it's not like brewing beer where you know in six weeks you could start again and try something else. Like this is it. I screwed up. It's a bad thing. <laughs> and if I get it perfect, I probably won't repeat it. Right? I mean, both things happen. Like thankfully, when you screw it up, it does go away eventually. You know, it doesn't haunt you. Well, maybe it haunts me. It doesn't haunt most anybody else for the rest of their life. It just haunts me for the rest of my life. Sure. But yeah, yeah. I still have vintages where I'm like, I should have done better. Mm. Yeah. You let that drive the future sure. vintages. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So. so tell me about early when you got here. What was different about it than Amity and what sort of appealed uh, to you about it? Um, on some level, it probably wasn't that different in the sense that um, Myron had definitely inspired my interest and, um, and has subsequently driven my style of white wine making mm -hmm. and there were a lot of white wines here and I like that like I really do like white wines and I really do enjoy making white wines which I think makes me a little atypical as far as my makers go like you know Thomas Hausman at Anime is probably one of the first people I think of who likes white wine as much as I like and if the two of us get together we can get geeky about our white wine and what are we doing and you know what what should we do differently what yeast are you using I mean like we can get down pretty quickly into sort of the nitty-gritty and um, and I had told Mary when she hired me I felt like actually that was her weakness was that her white wines weren't near as good as they could be or should be and um, and so that certainly drew me in. I mean we have seven white wines here so seven white grapes and not that we usually make more white wines than that, but we have seven white grapes, and so it's. Um, and when I came, there were five, and we subsequently planted two more um, after I got here because we make this white blend called Seven, and we were buying fruit. And Mary's like, "Let's just have seven white grapes here." So we stopped buying fruit. We still have seven. We don't have to change the name or come up with for another reason. It's called Seven or anything else. So <laughs> I was all for it. Um, so. 
Uh, yeah, so I, probably on some level the whites drew me in. If it had been a really um, red wine dominated winery, I don't know if I would have been as interested in it. You mm -hmm. know, basically the focus had only been Pinot Noir. Um, but, I mean, two thirds of our production's white, so mm -hmm. it's for us it's a big part of of what we do and and uh, so and Susie probably Susie had been more vineyard focused so she had really loved the vineyard and even to this day while I have respect for it and I spend time in it it's not I'm really interested after it's fruit like give me the fruit because that's the side that I really enjoy mm -hmm. I'm not as interested on the on the vineyard side as some maybe some winemakers are that are really out in the vineyard and really babysitting their fruit like that's not my strength like my strength is on the winery side um, so I think that so with Susie it was one of the probably the differences is that she'd sort of been dividing and when she and Mary took this over and like I think Mary needed Susie out in the vineyard they didn't necessarily have a full-time vineyard manager which we have now like mm -hmm. she needed someone with that skill set mm -hmm. um, and uh, and yeah so I brought something else when I came just as a with them and by then Sebastian had been hired um, our vineyard manager so Sebastian had been hired the year before so we really had someone ready to take on the vineyard and make it his own and I could just focus on the wine side so yeah, yeah. so maybe about your how, what you consider your winemaking philosophy and maybe how it's developed uh, over the years um I'd say I'm I like to be hands off, but I'm absolutely not afraid to step in. Mm -hmm. So I won't, if I feel like something's going south or, or just is going in a direction I don't like, I'll step in. Like I have no compunction about that. And, and Myron taught me, it was one of the really good lessons. Uh, we made a Pinot Noir one year and it was, um, it was an organic wine and it was made sulfite free and it never went to a barrel and it was always a pain in the ass to make and because you had to protect it all the time and and he wanted it filtered and I I was like but it's so great like I don't why would you filter this wine you know like he's like it'll be better and I'm like and I just basically didn't believe him and he finally was like look filter half of it let it sit there for a month and we'll evaluate it and talk about it again and and so I did that and the filtered wine was better you know it was like it's a Pinot Noir, you're not supposed to filter Pinot Noir, you're going to strip all this color and all this flavor and all these things that come out of it. And it's like, yes, 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 but you also have a tool that might remove something that you don't want in it. And in this case, the wine was a lot cleaner, the texture was nicer, like it was prettier, it was brighter, it was just a better wine. And, and we didn't filter as a matter of course. Like, I mean, this had sort of been a one-off that he had wanted me to filter this wine, which is part of why I argued about it. It was like, this isn't like our standard protocol, like why, you know, and, and, um, and so I don't, you know, in the time, and I never gone back and asked him what he saw in that wine. I probably have a better feel myself of sort of, if I taste something and I wonder if, um, like you could find, I could add a product, which might or might not be a great thing, or I might just be able to filter it. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a bit of a philosophy of, and you certainly will always have winemakers that tell you filtering just has to remove good stuff. And yes, it probably does, but does it outweigh, you know, the, the, the bad stuff you're taking out outweigh? Or the risk. I mean, if you have a risk of, um, you know, Britannomyces or some sort of infection, are you, are you so convinced that filtering is e evil that you would send a wine to bottle that potentially will get a whole lot worse than a bottle, right? And... I do recognize, I go back to the fact that in the end, it's not my money. It's not my winery. It's not my money. I'm trying to build the best product possible mm -hmm. for someone else. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not willing to take some risks that maybe a, uh, an owner, owner winemaker would take because it isn't my money. Mm -hmm. And I want a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I like what I do. <laughs> so there's a, so yeah, so it's, um, I don't, like I inoculate, I don't do native ferments and or uninoculated ferments. I think it's more accurate. And and the research that has shown more and more that if you've ever used a commercial yeast, that's your house yeast anyway. And then there's a couple strains that are real killer strains, and I happen to use one of them, which probably means that all my Pinot Noir ferments are finished with that killer strain. Like it probably takes over everything in the end. Um, 
but I still inoculate because the beginning part of the ferment will be run under what I put in, and it does, you know, change the style. And I'm dealing with just a state Pinot Noir now, mm -hmm. and it's predominantly Pomard clone, and so I need to introduce complexity, and I need to introduce um, some variation, and so the yeast is a good way for me to do that, mm -hmm. to bring in different yeasts, so, um, yeah. You mentioned your mathematics background. Yeah. Tell me how mathematics <laughs> plays into your winemaking. I'm really good at algebra. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just the precision. I think, and knowing that um, there's a, a correct answer when you're doing a formula. And if, I mean, I still like, I don't know, probably last year sometime, like I had a decimal point wrong. Like I'm still kicking myself. I was like, really? Like you put the, and so like it made a whole addition wrong. And like, and then I had to fix it because all, because I had moved a decimal point and I didn't catch it when I did it. And then I'm back later looking at, I think I was doing the entry like into the book and I'm like, wait a second, that's not, I was like, <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, you know, not, you know like, damn it, you know, I'm supposed to be better than this, right? So um, I do think that that's one thing of just, Doing the mathematics and, and doing calculations so much um, at university that I'm more comfortable looking at it and saying, yes, that's about right, or no, that's not about right. I mean, I do it automatically with additions now when I've got two different tanks, um, and maybe I'm adding SO2 to both of them or something, like, I immediately look to make sure that the ratio of SO2 addition sort of correlates with the two tanks that I'm putting it into, like that it just becomes, it's just part of what I do. I'm like, oh, that tank's twice as big, so there should be twice. Oh, but I'm only putting, you know, 50%. So like, but I do sort of check myself all the time kind of that way. That's why the decimal point was still like, <laughs> <laughs> I actually couldn't read it, but never mind. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I written it in pencil and I, and yeah, but I know how I lost the decimal point, but it still irritates me <laughs> that I did. <laughs> so anyway, it's all good. So Airly's kind of a unique setup, uh, being uh, completely female owned and operated. So tell yeah. me what the, uh, what the kind of importance of that is to you, being kind of a woman owned and operated winery here in Oregon. To be honest, it's not that important to me. It's, I, I struggle with it actually, philosophically. <laughs> this would be the only part, you might not want this in there, but I do feel like, and I think my husband summed it up really well, one time, as I brought home a bottle of wine, and I was like, I was talking about it, and we should try it, and I said, and a woman made this, and he's like, what am I supposed to do with that piece of information? Like, am I supposed to, like, judge it differently mm -hmm. because a woman made it? And I'm like, that's absolutely what I don't want, right? Like, I don't want to be, like, cut some slack or something because a woman made it. Like, that's not. So, but I do recognize it's a marketing tool. Mm -hmm. And, it, and there are women out there who are interested in supporting women and that to not use it would sort of be, or to not discuss it would be um, a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be a lost opportunity. Um, and it does go back to the fact that we are a business. Mm -hmm. While we love what we do, she has to keep making money so that I get paid, mm -hmm. so that this thing stays a business. <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. it's... Um, and maybe because of the background, because of the physics and math, like I had already been in a male-dominated industry, and in general, I make friends easier with men than with women anyway. So to me, it was like, whatever. It didn't matter that there weren't hardly any women. And, and I think, um, and it wasn't as if, and maybe right when I came in, we all sort of felt that way, because it wasn't like there was a community of, women mm -hmm. trying to support me like oh great there's a new woman in the industry we should like support her like it just didn't happen mm -hmm. and now there's an effort to do better about that but I don't know I, I do philosophically I, I balance it because there is obviously inequalities we do need to address those inequalities what's the best way to go about doing that and awareness is a big part of it right and mm -hmm. But I realize I've had different, like, we had a meeting, I guess, a couple months ago, just women in the industry, and we're sitting at a round table talking about our experiences, and the woman next to me is like, well, I've been called chicky, and I'm like, I have never been called <laughs> chicky in my life, right? Like, whether it's my voice, or how tall I am, or the fact that my hair's short, like, 
I do not. I get called sir more often than anything, right? So it's like, you know, I've had maybe a different experience than some women have had. So I've not been doubted that I could do something because of I'm a woman. And, and I've not doubted myself. I mean, Sebastian, our vineyard manager, teases me because sometimes I'll pick and he's like, you have muscles, you know. <laughs> but it's become a joke that basically I can do most things and then I come get them when there's something that's just literally too heavy. Or I can't figure out how to do it with a forklift. I go get Sebastian and he helps me, you know. So I don't have a problem asking for help just because physically he's stronger than I am, right? He is stronger than I am. Why, why shouldn't I take advantage of that, you know? So um, I don't know. So yeah, it's sort of a... I'm still undecided about it. I mean, I remember getting a scholarship because I was a woman in science. And I'm like, what? Like, shouldn't I actually be good at what you're <laughs> like, like, just because I'm a woman in science, you know, you're going to support me. And I, but apparently we need to, because I guess the number of women in math are dropping right again now. And I'm like, what's wrong? Like, what's wrong with your parents? I don't know what's wrong. I mean, clearly it needs to be addressed because I think women should be mathematicians. They're good at it, right? So... Yeah, but clearly somehow, we're, I don't know. I don't know. It's obviously an issue. <laughs> I'm obviously undecided and hung up about it. <laughs> but it's not important to me on some level. Interesting. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of makes sense. I mean, you talked about your sort of background in math and, and why you're too traditionally male-dominated yeah. dominated areas. And so you just sort of roll through it. I think. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. I, used to, I went to a female-dominated college because it had been previously all women and mm -hmm. I still knew more men than women, and you know, if girls were like, "How do you know this many guys?" I'm like, "I don't know. I like them. Like, I like talking to them. They're like down to earth, and they're like, you know, not worried about what clothes they're wearing. Whatever. I mean, <laughs> I guess it's just different interests. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for it, but my brothers. Maybe that's what it's all about. That was actually a pretty good answer, actually. So. <laughs> don't worry about it. So talk about early a little bit. You've been here long enough now that you kind of have a pretty good sense uh, of yeah. what you're doing here, what, what you have to work with here. Yeah. So tell me what you want early wines to express. What do you want people to get from wines you make? Acidity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, that an, is that an expression? Um, food driven. Mm -hmm. uh, I think varietally correct. I mean, one of the things I really get a kick about making so many white varietals is that um, especially if I have someone come in that says they don't like wines, white wines and they're not familiar with, mm -hmm. don't like white wines, it drives me crazy. I'm like, that's like half the world's grapes you've just written off, you know, I'm like, <laughs> let me get you, I usually try to get them to try at least one, you know. Um, but you could really sit in our tasting room and taste all these different varietals and begin to understand, like, maybe why you would like a grape or why you wouldn't like a grape and that it hopefully it opens up and maybe that goes back to the education too of like it opens up this world that you had previously written off and um, and so I'd say we do we're on a what's it called a Geneva double curtain so we have a different trellis system than most people in our fruiting zones up high so we get a lot more sun exposure and it definitely impacts um, especially our Pinot Noir. So we get a lot more color and we get a lot more tannin, mm -hmm. um, which then actually creates a struggle for me because ideally I'd like to be creating these more delicate, feminine, <laughs> acid-driven Pinot Noirs, and that's not the fruit I'm given. Mm -hmm. So I've had to sort of adjust my style and work with mm -hmm. um, what the fruit is and then still try to make something that's more food-friendly and, and brighter and um, more, yeah, a little more acid driven and it's been a, so it's, I don't know if, there's probably a love-hate relationship there with Pinot Noir here. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the whites, we're a cool side as well, so there's, we, we get two things happening, but we're very cool. And one of the things that's come out of this Oregon State um, crop load trial, or OSU crop load trial that I'm involved in, we all have temperature monitors. like. Everybody's vineyard's blind, and she throws up the data, and like one of them is the growing degree days, right? And it's like goes along like this, and it's like this, and then it goes along like this. I'm like, that's me down there, like significantly cooler, even in a hot year, than anybody else. So it helps with the acid. Um, I think whites do beautifully here. Um, generally, we had two years where nothing got right. They were so cold that we literally didn't harvest. But, um, but I do think that. 
in that sense, the whites are really driven by the location. I mean, both wines are driven by the location, but it's less of a battle for me with the whites, whereas the Pinot Noir, I'm definitely always sort of working and trying to convince it to give me something that it's not quite so inclined to give me, right? <laughs> if I went to make this big, jammy, like, tannic, Syrah, like Pinot Noir, you could probably do that here pretty easily, but that's not what I'm interested in making, so it sets up this dichotomy, this struggle of, oh, come on, give me a little pretty, you know? <laughs> so. So yeah. what are the white varietals you're working with then? Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, um, Gewürztraminer Riesling, Chardonnay, Muller Thurgau, and Muscat Nell. So in the Muller and the Riesling and the Gewürz are from the original plantings. Mm -hmm. And then the Gris, um, half the Gris on some old Riesling and half the Gris on some old Gewürz, which definitely impacts the Gris. And then the Pinot Blanc we put in on on Marshall Foch, actually, which I think has impacted the Pinot Blanc. My Pinot Blanc seems to ripen a little faster than it used to at Amity because we have the Amity cuttings. We, so we took cuttings from Amity for our grafting here. And, um, and I think the Foch might, which is an earlier ripening hybrid, I think it might be pushing the Blanc a little bit. And then, um, yeah, and then the Muscat now we put in. And the Chardonnay was, you'd have to double check with Mary. There was, can't remember what clone of Chardonnay was here originally, and it basically didn't do well. And she and Susie had replanted mm -hmm. into the Dijon, and then now um, we've got red blotch virus in the vineyard, so we actually ripped out a huge chunk of the Chardonnay because mm. it was so badly infected. So I actually only have a little tiny strip of Chardonnay now. Mm. That's all I have left, but um, which is all right. I'm not a big fan. If uh, any white wine I don't enjoy making, it would be Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I don't, I just, I think I love the aromatics of the aromatic varietals and Chardonnay just isn't an aromatic white. And so I'm a, always a bit stumped as to, which makes it a great winemaker's wine, except for the fact that I'm a bit like, hmm, not that. So it's the only thing I do in barrel. I sort of have a, a style that I make it to because, and it gives her a barrel fermented white, it gives her a Chardonnay when people mm -hmm. come in and ask. So it's part of the seven blend, like, I don't mind doing it, but it doesn't inspire me. I've been trying to expand my palate. I decided recently that I didn't drink enough other people's wine. So one of the things we started drinking was Chablis. And it was like, well, if I could make Chardonnay that tastes like this, I might, you know, so that takes a research. I have to start figuring out. What I'd really be curious to know is like, what are their harvest numbers? Like, what are they harvesting at? Because mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's just the winemaking that's driven it. I think the fruit coming in has already started to set up the mm -hmm. style. So, um, yeah, so I do. I do go through these stints where I'm like, we got to drink something else besides our own and find out what other people are doing. And I still love to do that. I, I love to call a friend and say, I'll bring lunch. Can we go through your barrel room? You know, and, and uh, it's always good for me to just taste other people's wines and find out what they're doing and talk to them about it. You always learn something. You didn't know you were, you know. I visited Jason Lett one time, and he had these floating tank liners because he's like me. He has all these fixed capacity tanks, and and he. And he's very concerned about dissolved oxygen. And he had these inflatable liners that he puts in the tank and then fills them with air. And so they sit right on top of the wine to minimize that. I was like, that looks like a lot of work. It might work, but that's a lot of work to get that <laughs> out. You know? I'd be curious actually if he still uses them. But so you end up talking about things that maybe aren't on your radar. And mm -hmm. somebody says something and you're like, hmm, okay. You know, so. You talked about being kind of atypical in terms of having more whites here yeah. and being more white inclined yourself. Tell me about and, and tell me about the people who do come in the tasting room and say, I don't like white wines. Are you able to change any minds? Are you able to? Every once in a while. I can't convince all of them. A lot of times, as soon as I ask them, it's like, well, they're sweet. I'm like, no, <laughs> let's, let's start right there. <laughs> white wines are not necessarily sweet. In fact, only like a percentage of them are sweet and most of them aren't sweet, right? So, um, and I think the other thing that really comes about is getting, which is tough for, for anybody that maybe hasn't focused on their palate, is getting people to, dis, to separate fruit and sweet. Because mm -hmm. they're like, well, I don't like the Pinot Blanc because it's sweet. I'm like, it's not sweet, it's fruity. I mean, I can show you the numbers. Like, there's not sugar in here, but it is a fruit-driven wine, versus the Pinot Gris is not so fruit-driven. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's like, so figure out what's sweet. And now you may not like fruit-driven wines, and that I have no problem with. If you tell me you don't like fruit-driven wines, I'm like, that's perfectly acceptable, right? Like, that's a different conversation, and I have no problem with that answer. But 
Um, and uh, and we do make, a, I make a brain, range of sweetness too, because there's people that come in and do want sweet wines, and I'm good with that too, right? I mean, there's not a wrong way to drink wines. I tell most people, I'm like, if you look, if we all drank the same wine, there'd be four on the grocery store shelf, right? And there's not, right? There's <laughs> there's an overwhelming selection on the grocery store shelf, so. Um, and I, I say now we have customers that definitely come in for our white wines, mm -hmm. you know, that and I've been told, well, I, shop, I buy all my whites here, you know, so I haven't won them over yet on my Pinot Noir, but, you know, that's all right. I can live with that. So um, that is probably one of my pet peeves when I get on a soapbox, though, is that um, white wines are not respected the way red wines are. Mm -hmm. And it drives me crazy because I, I actually honestly, I think I honestly now believe that white wines are harder to make. Really? Timing is so critical and they show flaws so quickly. Red wine, red wine bails you out of a lot of stuff. <laughs> and oftentimes, especially a small winery, like everything's in barrel, which means you really screw up a barrel. You potentially just, it's only 60 gallons, it's 25 cases, and you may just dump it, right? Or you distill it or something like that, right? If I tr screw up the tank of Mueller, like that's 4,000 gallons, and there ain't no getting rid of it. Like, I can't do anything else with it. That's our Mueller for the year. Mm -hmm. So there's an aspect of that, of just, um, and I still have wines that way. I mean, there, there's a, was a Mueller one year and a Riesling another year where, you know, I just messed up. I wasn't, my timing wasn't right. And the wine was never bad, but the wine wasn't as good as it should have been. Mm -hmm. um, and when I judge white wines, especially something like um, Sip and McMinnville or whatever, like, so often I'm going through, I'm like, okay, well, they fermented that too hot. Okay, they stirred, the, you know, it's like, I just sit there and sort of like, well, they should, you know, it's like, they're just not that good. I mean, so many of them, it's not that they're not good, it's that they could be better. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. It's not that they're not good. Or they're imbalanced, right? There's, they either have taken them bone dry, at which point you're like, ha, oh, that's so great. You know I mean? Like, <laughs> there's nothing left. It's all minerality and uninteresting. Or are they left too much sugar, at which point it's sort of cloying. And it's like, because um, I think even people will comment, even on my sweet wines, like they're still acid there. So they're not sticky. Like they're not cloying. You don't feel sort of gross after you have one. Like mm -hmm. they're still refreshing. They just happen to be, have more sugar in them. And I think those are all maybe intricacies that, left out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the end I think too I really want them to be pretty so that does drive my style that I want pretty white wines like I don't want reduction I don't particularly want a lot of these stirring and oak and yeasty notes like I want them to be pretty mm -hmm. unflawed mm -hmm. yeah and uh, I'm like yeah I don't really like drinking ones that aren't <laughs> They're not pretty. I'm kind of like, why am I drinking this? Yeah, no. It's a little harsh, but yeah, it is something I definitely am evaluating mm -hmm. when we're when I'm trying wine. So anyway, so you're coming up on sort of 20 years in the Oregon wine industry now. Tell me, <laughs> tell me, I know, I know. <laughs> out time flies. <laughs> So tell me about, in addition to, besides just pure size, what, right. what are the changes you've seen in the, in the industry since you, since you started? Um, I feel like, and maybe we talk about it more, but there is cer certainly small winemakers or small winery, winemakers of small wineries um, do experiment more and maybe, and, I, and maybe it's part of, it might even be a little bit cultural. I mean, if we wanted to look at the giant picture of this, we have this generation coming up behind us that has been taught that they were special, right? And taught that they're unique. And I think there's an aspect of that being applied to their winemaking. Like mm -hmm. they're trying things and doing things because it creates a story, not necessarily because it creates a better wine. Mm -hmm. Does that, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it kind of sounds sort of mean and I don't mean it in a mean way because they periodically they make some really beautiful wines doing these things. But 
I do feel like there's a an effort to be a traditional and sort of buck the trend. And that's one thing I would say. And maybe because we've built such a strong industry that um, an Oregon's known for quality and um, and if you drink Oregon like you expect it to be good, that they have a little um, flexibility or leeway with mm -hmm. experimenting because there's the support of the whole industry behind them. Um, and I don't know, like I don't know the California industry well enough. Like if I were in California, would I be finding these same little new, but is there an aspect of Oregon that says we're independent and we're green and we try these different things that then brings winemakers here that are interested in being independent and trying. Like, I don't know sort of how that feeds on itself. Um, but there is definitely, um, and there's definitely more competition for a customer. I mean, to have so many labels out there um, means it's not just, it's not good enough to just make good wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, on somewhat level, once Myron was known for making good wine, like Amity was known for making good wine and you bought Amity because it was going to be good. And I don't feel like th that, that doesn't hold as much sway in the same way now. That not only do you have to have make good wine, then you have to have a good story. Uh, or you have to be women owned and operated. Or you have to have someone like Mary that really when you come into the tasting room just makes you have such a good time. So the experience becomes so, and we're seeing that in our customers too, that in the past customers came to buy wine and now, um, especially your generation, like younger customers, they come because they want to sit here and have a glass of wine and have a nice conversation. Like, and maybe they'll buy a bottle of wine and they don't mind paying a tasting fee. I mean, we have a tasting fee now, which we didn't for years and years because there's so many people that are just coming to taste. They're coming for the experience. They're not coming to bring home a case of wine. And um, it does change a little bit how you interact with customers and sort of what you set up and things that you try to do because mm -hmm. of that. Um, and that may go back to then that same of changing your wine style because that's part of the experience and creating a different type wine, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and doing something so that you have a story to tell when someone comes into your tasting room to taste. So. And the big guys or the traditional guys, you know, Adelsheim or someone like that can still, I don't want to say they're on their coattails, but they still have such a broad base following or Elk Cove. I mean, they're just a big mm -hmm. winery and they're going to sell mm -hmm. because they're well known and they're consistent and they're everywhere. You can find their product and it's a good product, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, um, they maybe have a little bit different, but even Gina over at Adelsheim, you know, I mean, she's usually messing with something when I, you know, when I talk to her, she's got some experiment going or you know right now they're fermenting Chardonnay at different temperatures like you know how does it change for Chardonnay um, if they ferment it you know six degrees warmer so mm -hmm. than somewhere else so it's not like the big guys aren't messing I went to conference one time in Gallo was there was a representative from Gallo and she's talking about 5,000 gallon experiments right and like <laughs> I don't even make 5,000 gallons of Pinot Noir <laughs> I'm just like yeah I do like 10 gallon experiments <laughs> I mean, it was just, but the scale, the concept that she's dealing with so much wine that 5,000 gallons is like throw away for her, right? You know, it was like, it was hard to imagine actually. Yeah. So Amazing. It is, it is sort of, uh, you do realize how small we are when you talk to somebody like that. But yeah. yeah. She's messing, she's experimenting with more wine than I make. <laughs> so, because that was like one of like four experiments, right? So that's 20,000 gallons of wine that is an experiment, which is not to say they'll throw it away, but it just means she's willing to risk right. 5,000 gallons of wine or 20,000 gallons of wine, whatever it was. So, yeah. That's amazing. It is <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at A to Z or Willamette, like you start to, under, you know, it's not such a big stretch to be messing with wine, but for me, yeah. Yeah. That's a huge amount of wine. <laughs> so. What about yeah. as you look ahead for Oregon wine? What do you see uh, over the next, say, decade in, in Oregon wine? I think um, I think it will be key to maintain quality. We are still so small. We still make less than 1% or something of the world's wine, right? I mean, we still are just tiny. And, um, and that... Uh, so I think one of our best selling features is that, that we're known, we've created um, a standard for quality and we've created a, um, you know, our, our federal, I mean, our, our 
varietal limits and things are all higher than the federal limit. Like mm -hmm. we've really, and we've created, I think, a lot of truth in advertising on our labels. And I think to maintain that is is important. And I saw so this bill um, that's going through our state senate right now, or I guess it's, I think it's stalled. I'm not actually sure its status at the moment. But part of what we're trying to do is protect the name when the fruit leaves the state because this is becoming a factor so much fruits being grown here now it's more than we can deal with and it's heading to california and then they're calling it willamette well that actually goes against our labeling so it's how do we enforce in other states you know to follow our labeling regulations um and i do think those unfortunately that sort of litigious aspect is going to be important that um, you're not just going to be able to trust them to do the right thing. You're going to have to go after them when they don't. Mm -hmm. And they're not paying their grape taxes. Like, they're not doing things that we in-state have to do. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think it's all part of protecting sort of our name and, and, and our quality. Um, I don't know. I, I, I suspect more and more our size winery will disappear. Mm -hmm. So if you're really small, um, maybe less than a thousand cases, you can basically sell everything direct to consumer. You don't have to find that many people mm -hmm. and you can get it sold. Um, but our problem is we can't sell direct. We make too much to do that, but we're not big enough for most distribution. So distribution is a constant problem for us um, and it's just getting worse as little guys are continuing. I mean, it's every industry, like we're not a unique industry in that the little guys are being bought up by the medium guys who are being bought by the big guys, right? And, and it is a continual battle of trying to, I mean, we have two, three, three distributors who have been with us a long time and I really like them. They're Ohio, New York, and DC. And they do a great job and they sell like three pallets a year. Well, it's not actually enough. <laughs> I need a lot of them, but most people their size sell. Now these all happen to be independently owned family, like single sole proprietors, mm -hmm. and they haven't sold. Like they love what they're doing. They're not necessarily doing it to make a bunch of money. They do it because they love what they're mm -hmm. doing, you know? And, and um, but that also means that they just don't sell that much of our wine. And I can only help them so far. If I go out and do sales and spend a week selling wine with them, like we can place some wine, but in the end, um, you know, they only have so many accounts. They can only move so much wine. Mm -hmm. All these things, like, and then they just can't sell that much. So, it's uh, it's all definitely part of the struggle and mm -hmm. the balance of of that. So, Piper, I <laughs> 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 do rescue. What about as you look ahead for yourself and for Early? You're mentioning the kind of coming struggles for wineries and right. size. What do you see as you look ahead for yourself uh, ten years in the future? <laughs> God, you sound like my brother. <laughs> well, you mentioned how you're settling down here in Oregon, so I figured I gotta yeah. ask. No, it, it's actually, uh, I don't have a good answer. It's driving my family a little bit crazy. <laughs> they're, just, they're starting to think I should have an answer. Um, I think, I recognize here at some point Mary's gonna retire. And in reality, this business probably needs to have an owner, a winemaker. Mm -hmm. like, fact that she pays my salary and her own salary is a little I don't know if it's a drain but it it makes it every, everything a little tighter here right and if if she ran if the person who bought it did both um, they'd have to work a whole lot harder than Mary and I have to work but you know their profit would look a little better mm -hmm. because of that so um, but one of the things I have loved about working for Mary and it's I think is unique. I don't know if I can find it again. Is that she really just lets me make the wine, mm -hmm. and and if I don't have wine making, I don't have to be here. So, I, I'm you know all summer I'll basically work four day weeks, mm -hmm. and and I'll probably only work six hours a day, right? I mean it's like I just do. I come in and I do what I need to do, and I look after everything. And if she needs something, then I stay. If she she needs me to cover the taste room, then I cover the taste room. But in the end. She doesn't just expect me to sit here when I don't have things to do. And, and she could probably push me harder to do sales. I spent about two weeks a year on the road doing sales. And, um, and I do recognize it as a principle. I have a certain caveat when I go out to sell wine because I am the person that made it mm -hmm. and people want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a strength. But um, she doesn't ask a lot of that of me. And, mm -hmm. and, and she really doesn't micromanage the wine style. I mean... If something's doing 
well or maybe not so well in the taste room, like, we'll talk about it. And she'll be like, you know, I get a lot of comments on this. And I'm usually like, well, what's wrong with them? And then, of course, I go home and I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's not quite the right response. So let's figure out what I did on that wine and sort of evolve it, you know. That, um, I remember the first year I came in, because I really like dry Riesling, and, and Susie had always made the Riesling here sort of on a medium sweet style. And so my first vintage is probably one of the few things that, I don't know if I messed it up, but I just dried the Riesling out. Like, I, I didn't take it bone dry, but it was pretty dry. Turned out we have a lot of lemon in our Riesling, and all our customers kind of went, what happened to our Riesling? And I was like, okay, they weren't ready for that, you know? <laughs> so, so the next year the Riesling went back, and then over time I've, like, brought the Riesling down. Like, <laughs> I, you know. And we actually, right now, we have two. So the two different sweetness levels. We actually now have three. Okay, we have a sparkling at, a, at the sweetest, and then we have two different Rieslings at two different sweetness levels. So, um, you know, so I, in some way she's come along behind me because she was used to Susie's style of wines, and then as it changed, and she had to then talk about my wines. Like, mm -hmm. so she talks about them certainly different. I don't think about it anymore. But there was, I remember sort of a transition period of going in and listening to her talk and realize she was now starting to tell my story instead of Susie's story, you know, that I had sort of influenced um, the tasting room in that sense of, mm -hmm. of what I thought was important and, um, and how I do things and, and addressing that mm -hmm. sort of the style. And now we, I don't even think we talk about it. I mean, I've been with her now longer than Susie was, so we crossed that a little while ago. But mm -hmm. It is, um, I think one of my weaknesses still is, is not, um, not knowing, like my knowledge is like this, like it's really strong, but it's like this in the world of wine, right? It's the Willamette Valley and the varietals that we can grow here. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I've thought about doing is starting to work towards the WSCT mm -hmm. um, or an MW and just, and then if I do that, what, what can I do with it? You know, does it help in teaching? Like, do I end up teaching somewhere? Mm -hmm. Last time I was up at Schmeckeda and talking with um, Sandra up there, she's like, as soon as you retire, let me know, I'll give you a teaching job, you know what I mean? So uh, even if it was that informal, like I'm only teaching one class or just on winemaking or something, not trying to run a program, mm -hmm. is that sort of there? It could be hard to make wine for somebody else. I don't know. I mean, heck, it's like... You know, my husband teases me, but basically I come into work when I roll out of bed, right? Like, and my <laughs> brothers are like... And I, and I told them that. I was like, one of the problems I'm worried about in another job is that I actually have to be at work on time. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, this isn't that big of a hang-up. I'm like, <laughs> for you, it's not, because both of you have a job where you have to be there on time, right? And you've always had a job. Like, neither of you have not had a job when there's not a time to be there, right? And it's like, I'm used to this. Like, I love it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real good quality of life thing for me. So, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> so that's a real factor when I think about the next 10 yeah. years of... You've been just kind of, you, you kind of got lifestyle uh, here. I do. <laughs> I absolutely do. And I'm loath to give it up. Like, I mean, I ask everyone, so I, I cringingly, so what's your five-year plan? You know, mm -hmm. and eventually the five-year plan is I'm selling the place. And I'm like, damn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Originally, we thought I might buy it when, it when I first started working for her. Because my husband's always been interested in owning a small business, which has not necessarily been my interest, but it was his. And... And um, we talked about it, you know, and we looked at her financials a couple times over the year. And we've done it a few times. And basically every time we look at it, we're like, no, <laughs> we're not doing this. <laughs> this is way too hard to make anybody doing this, you know. So. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think she's resigned to the fact that she's not passing it off on me. But, um, <laughs> um, and I think I still believe that she's really what drives the winery. I mean, she'll say she couldn't do it without my quality wines, which there's an aspect of that. But if people come into the taste room, who they know is Mary and who they are charmed by and who they enjoy talking to is Mary, right? I mean, that's, and neither my husband or I want to do that. You know, I mean, I'll come in and she'll be like, yes, yeah, so these customers stayed to dinner. And I'm like, what? She's like, well, they wouldn't leave. And I was cooking and I just finally asked them if they wanted to have, and they said yes. And I'm like, by golly, there'd be a gate down there and it would be locked at five o'clock. <laughs> like, in fact, we probably couldn't even live here, you know. There's a map to the closest McDonald's on the back. <laughs> Corvallis is that way. Salem and Monmouth are that way. Yeah. No, it's, um, 
and that's her though i mean and she she loves that and she loves talking to people and and all of those aspects and i'm just exhausted thinking about mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh and my husband's very similar to me so so neither of us and i think if it's not a principle in the tasting room i think that's a real weakness mm -hmm. i mean i think it goes back to that experience and having that experience and, and really talking to the person that and she's on the crush battle harvest so it's not like she doesn't now know what's going on and how to do stuff and things like that it's just the decisions and the calculations are all left up to me mm -hmm. but she's definitely involved and she's out in the vineyard and she's talking with sebastian about spray programs like it's not that she just runs the business she knows how all this works mm -hmm. she just doesn't have a desire to do it herself mm -hmm. and um, and so, in fact, I have to be, sometimes it's one of the things I have to work on is that I'll run trials and I don't necessarily bring them into her to taste. And I should be because it's part of what built her palate as well as to say, okay, taste these two wines. Like this was last year's trial. Mm -hmm. And I've made a decision and basically whatever decision I've made with, she's fine with, but it still is beneficial if she actually mm -hmm. participates in that and tastes in that. So that's all part of what she can talk about mm -hmm. when she's here. Sure. Solving the problems of the world. <laughs> Many a conversation I come out there working on solving problems sure. of the world. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And the setup we have, um, you'll have intimate groups that won't maybe talk to anybody else, but oftentimes, especially if they're at the big table, like part of it is meeting people and mm -hmm. talking to people that weren't part of your party originally mm -hmm. and, and building those conversations, so building those relations. That's all part of what she's, she's very, very good at, I think. So. So you took, you took kind of an, an orthodox route into the industry. A little uh, bit, yeah. What, what advice would you have for someone who wanted to enter the industry today? Um, I still don't think the degree is that important. Uh, I think s some of the classes would help, mm -hmm. just like they helped me. Um, I still think you could start at the bottom like I did. I think you can start as a seller rat. And, and if you just, it's, it's working hard, but it's also, it is, it is physical. There's no question. It's a physical job. And if you're not prepared to sort of collect scars and things like I have a couple. <laughs> <laughs> and like One of them was really stupid and one of them was a total accident. But you know, it's like, uh, those sort of things just happen and you have to sort of recognize that they're going to be happy. It's not a, it's not an office job. Every day is different, which is what I love about it. Like, so there's a cycle, there's a rhythm, and I kind of know what I'm going to be doing at any time of year. But as far as the day-to-day -day goes, no. I mean, and I'll come in and I'll have a plan and Mary's like, I need help with, and then like that, my plan's busted, right? Like, okay, that's done. We're going to go do that today, you know? And I think that flexibility and that willingness to just you know, especially if you're purchasing fruit is key. I mean, it helps a lot now that we're a state, but when you're buying fruit, you know, you're like, yeah, they'll be here at 11. Uh-huh, you know, <laughs> they show up at three or four or five or, well, we're well, not gonna get this last load on in the dark because it's too dark to see the truck now. So we'll bring it to you tomorrow morning. And you're just like, <laughs> you know what I have going on tomorrow morning? Like, you know, I mean, it's just what it is. And that would drive some people crazy. I mean, there's a, there's some people that want it organized and that's not this, even big wineries, like they may have it better organized than I have it, but in the end you still have that flexibility of, well, I'm five tons over, you know, and you're like, well, that doesn't fit in the tank it was supposed to fit into. So what, which means if I put it there, which means I can't, you know, I mean, all of a sudden there's this whole mm -hmm. trickle down effect very quickly. And um, so I think that flexibility is important and um, like any job, just willing to sort of step up and do anything i'd say the employees i've struggled with the most are the ones that don't just leap into it mm -hmm. um and uh and that's um and the passion is it doesn't have to be blatant i don't think i just think that the interest needs to be there and the curiosity and the you know you don't have to be exclaiming to me how much you love something but just that you want to learn or you want to taste or you want to build your vocabulary I mean I think the learning is important mm -hmm. uh, maybe different than some more structured jobs the fact that the technology is changing and that vintages are changing and the weather changes and this year is not like last year which means I'm going to have different problems in the vineyard and we had frost damage this spring which means like crops are already down which means it's not going to ripen the same like 
those things just happen and you're just gonna, you know, so I'm already sort of thinking about, well, last time we had frost damage, like I like this yeast a little bit better with those mm -hmm. vintages, so I'll probably order a little bit more of that and a little bit less of this or whatever, right? So it's, um, yeah, and uh, I, mean, I, I did, I started fixing computers, putting this stupid internet network together. <laughs> And, uh, and, and topping barrels. I mean, that's, that's where I started, you know, it was like, and I didn't know anything. I mean, I just, I really didn't know anything. I didn't know what I didn't know. I mean, that's, <laughs> and Myron was willing to say, that's okay, I'll teach you, you know, and, and I did get lucky, I think. Um, anybody that had Myron as a mentor, I think in the industry would tell you that, mm -hmm. um, that he, he is so passionate about it, and he loved it so much, and he had such an opinion about it that you couldn't help but sort of learn from him. Mm -hmm. And he may rub you the wrong way, and you may, he may drive you bonkers, but I, I figure that's part of his charm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, anyway, he's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's Myron. <laughs> That's all the questions that I have okay. for you today. Uh, is there anything I should have asked that I didn't? Anything we should have covered that we didn't? I kind of have an open open <laughs> forum here at the end, so, you know, any last words of wisdom? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think... I'd like to imagine that most people who are drawn to the industry are drawn because of the community. They're drawn because they enjoy sitting down to, you know, to dinner and having that social event, even if it's just two of you, but that you're going to sit and talk and enjoy the food that's in front of you. And, and then hopefully there's a bottle of wine that also makes the evening better. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't, I don't think every bottle of wine has to be amazing. My parents, 50th wedding anniversary was last week on Wednesday and they retired to Hawaii so I hauled a magnum of Pinot on the plane a 99 and of course it had to be in the hold which was you know but anyway I had just had the bottle a normal 750 of that wine and I knew it was showing well and I took the magnum and of course um it was good it had just been shook up <laughs> on an eight-hour plane ride, and I don't know how hot it, it didn't get too hot in Honolulu because the ice was still sort of cool, but, like, this was not ideal conditions, right? And it's hot. It's like we're on the beach, and it's 80 degrees and, you know, 90% humidity, and um, it's not the perfect condition, but it was yet another, like, it added to the joy of us just all sitting there and having this sort of unique bottle of wine, and I have an older brother who has a hard time with alcohol, it does something, just, he has some sort of allergic reaction to it. A lot of my older wines he's okay with, so I, I've yet to figure out what the heck he's reacting to. And it's not just wine, but it's alcohol. Anyway, like he could enjoy a glass, like for him, that was one of the wines, and it was part of why I brought it, is I figured he'd be able to have it, you know? So it was like, as a family, we're sitting around this table and this great meal in this beautiful place and just enjoying being together and the wine just sort of adds to that. And I think that's how I look at wine, is that it's this, it makes an occasion better. It's not the reason you're there, and it's not like the end-all be-all, and you're not trying to make a perfect bottle of wine every time, you're just trying to make a nice, enjoyable bottle of wine every time. That's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that'd be the only thing I have to add about. I like that, like the right, the right wine at the right time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and like it doesn't that. have to be an amazing bottle of wine. And I think we've all had it, where you've had this wine and you think it's great, and then uh, you have it again and you're like, like I had recently, probably last year I had it happen. I had wine with some friends and it was a beautiful bottle of wine and I really enjoyed it and I happened to find it and I bought it and I brought it home and my husband and I had it. We're like, yeah, it's good. Like, I know it was the same wine, like, but the, you know, things had changed. And so it was good. It was a solid bottle of wine. There was absolutely nothing wrong with it. It didn't have the spark that it had that night with friends mm -hmm. in a restaurant, mm -hmm. you know, in a meal. And, and that's what I think can be fun about wine. And so I don't look at that as a frustration. I just look at that as that's actually what made the evening probably more fun is we had this great bottle of wine, which turned out to just be a really good bottle of wine, <laughs> but that's okay. You know? <laughs> it was great that night and that's all that matters. So, you know, that's kind of, um, that's probably, the, maybe that's part of my philosophy. I don't know. Definitely. definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. 
Well, thank you so My much pleasure. for your time today and for your, for your thoughts. Yeah. And uh, we will let you off the hook here. All right. Sounds good.